This podcast is a peek behind the curtain for those of us who never had the pleasure of serving America in uniform. And we seek to highlight the pride, privilege, benefit, and sometimes sacrifice of that service that's unique to just 1% of the citizenry. While usually appreciated and often revered, their service is foreign to most, yet they represent threads woven into the very fabric of our culture. These are their stories. These are their demons. These are their lessons. This is the Carry the Load podcast. So help, help people understand, because, you know, I, I know that a lot of people will look at something like this and they're going, OK, hold on, merging vets and players. What do veterans and former high level athletes, what do they have to do with each other? So how do you explain that to people? Yeah, so on my end, I didn't understand it, honestly, when I first started. I was actually a little angry that the athletes were in there trying to listen to what us veterans were going through. So, angry? Angry. I was a little upset. Like, you know, what I went through, I was it's private. So I sat down and I had to learn the word trust, first of all, and understand to start opening it up and letting it out. And then it was uh, Andrew Whitworth, actually. He got us some tickets to a Rams game, and I started screaming his name. And he's walking literally five, ten feet away from me, and I know he heard me. But I saw his eyes, and this this man's one of the nicest guys. And his eyes were red. His eyes were just war. And you can tell that the moment that he's on that field, he's a whole different person. He's going for blood. He's going for the same exact side of things of, of war, basically. So on my end, I started recognizing how similar uh, we actually are. Our uniform gets stripped all the time. Athletes get stripped all the time. Injured overseas, injured over here on the ball field so alike you get it ripped off what do you do next what is your purpose next you've worked so long i know myself i went into the marine corps thinking i was going to do 20 years i thought i was going to be a lifer right an athlete they go in thinking that they're going to be a tom brady they're going to be an aaron Rodgers, so on and so on guess what two three years in they're cut they're stripped you know so what josh if you're drawing the connection for somebody what, what kind of words do you use now that you understand what guys who have been in, in the heat of battle, like Denver, what are the words that you use to give people that connection? What I tell people is that when you come into MVP and you look at MVP merging vets and players, that means that we're mentally, we're on the same exact level. So they have C, we have CTEs, we have all the PTSDs, we have all those similar things that they go through, we go through the same exact thing. So when I'm showing a person and telling a person about MVP, it's like, we're, look, we're merging rest and players and we're coming together because mentally we're on the same exact level. We get it mentally. They're in a different war and we're in a different war, but we're in a war. And in, in between those, those lines, it's war, just like you just explained. Yeah, the stakes are different. Yes. We, we, you know, we, we, have to, we have to acknowledge that. But, you know, as I'm hearing both of you talk about it, I've actually got this mental picture, if, if I'm in either one of your shoes, that there was, a, I don't, I don't want to say holier than thou, because, uh, you know, I, I know you both, and I know that that's not how you, uh, how you look at things. But there's a little bit of an arrogance there, is, is, is the word I would use to describe how you viewed, mm -hmm. wait a minute, why is this guy... Absolutely. thinking that he can stand shoulder to shoulder with me because he doesn't understand what I've been through. Absolutely. When I first started, um, I didn't realize that I was different and I had a little ego on my chest. You know, it's like I did two wars. I was with second battalion, seven Marines. I'm better than you kind of, you know, behavior. And then sitting down with them and then Jay, Jay Glazer, founder of MVP, he sat there and he asked a question. How do you feel when you're on the street? Do you expect everybody to sit there and cater to you mm. or can you just sit back and say motherfucker i'm different but inside your head and i really started thinking about that is somebody cuts me off somebody does this i had to actually be humble for a little bit and i think that was my biggest piece for me is i had to get humble i had to understand that this is a piece of me it's part of me but i can't control what i'm about to do only i can control my destiny at the end of the day yeah i did so the story 2015, I just remember I was on my couch completely depressed. I was broke. I didn't have any money. I was addicted to gambling. I had to file Chapter 7 bankruptcy. That And that moment, that humbled me. I was crying with tears in my eyes and tears rolling down my cheeks. I was really frustrated. Didn't know where to go, who to turn to, what to do. 
and I just sit up on my on my couch and I threw my shoulders back and I started moving furniture around in my house. I started making little changes. I moved the table around in the kitchen. I moved the TV around. I couldn't watch it because I didn't have any electricity. I go take freezing cold showers. I didn't know at that time that it was healing me. It was allowing me to breathe deep breaths and the water was getting warmer and warmer. What, what is it about the organization MVP? What is it about the, the, the physical aspect of actually bringing former players and former veterans together in the same room to do a little workout and then to really just kind of push forward with a group therapy? What, what is it about that process that's so powerful for y'all? There's times that you'll walk in there and somebody will start tearing up while working out. You get that little bit of a push because they're so, they may be a little sad because maybe they're out of shape. Maybe they're upset about what's happened throughout that week, but having that vulnerability and just giving them sometimes just that one time to work out for 30, 45 minutes, you can see emotions during that time. And at MVP during that workout, somebody will come up, put their hand on the shoulder and say, hey, come on, you're with me, buddy teams, right? It's how we always work. It's always buddy teams. It's always with somebody. But, you know, that peer-to-peer -peer support huddle, you already have those endorphins flowing. You're kind of already feeling a little bit vulnerable. A lot of physical trainers will tell you after they're done with that hour session, they probably take another 20, 30 minutes to talk to their client. So, Josh, you've obviously seen the movie MVP. Yes, several times. <laughs> <laughs> how, did, how did that resonate with you? When you, when you were watching it and you see somebody going through something that you had been through, how did that resonate with you? Uh, truly, 100%, because when I had, I had kids in, in 2009, and that's when I got my opportunity you know, for the lead. And when I saw Mo and his family- Wait a minute, we, we, that's when you got the opportunity for the lead? Yeah, so when I got, the, when I got my shot in the NFL, so I played in the AFL first, mm -hmm. and I got my shot in the AF NFL. Mm -hmm. So when I saw Mo on that screen, that was me because I was all about football. I was all about plays. I was all about, that's it. That's all I knew. And so when I saw the movie and I saw that scene, it just like, boom, the lights went off. And I was like, are you kidding me? Wow, this is why the movie was created because we are so similar and this is boom, identical. And this is, that's exactly how it was. But every time that scene comes on, I can feel myself really getting teary-eyed because that, that, that was me. And that's how I relate to the movie. And that's how all athletes are going to relate to the movie because we were dedicated. We were committed to the sport. We, we was trying to always be better, do better, get a bigger contract. We were always trying to do that. And whatever was behind was behind, but we were only doing it for our family. Once they told me I couldn't go to the VA, I wanted to go to a psych ward because I knew what I was trying to do. I knew that I was trying to commit suicide passing away. I've lost 56 guys to suicide from my unit alone. I know that it's that time to change, right? So literally the next day I put in a 30 day notice. Um, so at that point I grabbed my dog, I found a place for my dog to go to and I checked myself into a homeless sh shelter for Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. Um, so a lot of that movie that you're talking about is me on that beach attempting suicide El Capitan State Beach. Two surfers are the ones that found me. They're the ones that called the police. So that was a true story. True story right there. Yep. Yep. So, um, and then Nate came into my house. I didn't like Nate. That's actually how I found MVP. And I told him, you got to get out of my house. Um, Be being the barracks. Yep. Yep. Being the barracks. And that was my actual homeless shelter as well, too. Um, so Nate actually came to me and said, I want to do this. And it was my story, my coworker AJ's story, um, all around. And Nate played myself. So Nate Boyer is obviously who we're, who we're talking about, um, who I, I thought did a pretty bang up job yeah. in, in the movie. And Josh, you referenced the scene under the bridge. And I mean, it was an intense scene. It was, and for, for those who haven't seen it, uh, your character, Denver, um, and stop me if I'm wrong, but you're ready to take your own life. And Mo, the the uh, uh, the other the athlete character in this, tried to stop him. And did that did it happen that way? Where, Not that where, way. 
but there was several times that because of the word trust that I've already spoken about, I didn't trust. So me starting to tell what I went through actually affected me a little bit more and it made me really like, who am I telling, telling my darkest, deepest secrets to? Who am I doing this to, right? And pushing people away was my specialty. And this is all before the movie came before, out. Before, way before the movie. And it was kind of one of those pieces. It's you, you are trying to figure out why am I telling these strangers my darkest, deepest secrets, right? Why am I spitting these, these things out? I'm trying to understand that. So um, I did get pretty depressed and I, I went to Jay and Nate because they were a trusted source at that. And I did want to take my life again afterwards, you know? So at this point, though, obviously, you learn to trust Nate. Yep. What, what was it that, that he and Jay did or said? How did they earn your trust? Because that's, that's an important word. Jay actually came out and he asked a question, what are you proud of? And I sat back and it was like, what you want me to be proud of? What I did overseas? That's, no, that's stupid. I'm not going to tell you that I'm proud of. And he's like, no, I'm not asking that. There's so much good that you've also done overseas. Constantly, you guys come in here as veterans and you guys only talk about the negative. I think I was pretty zoned out at that time. I was a little upset and I finally came through and I was just like, you know what? I did get a presidential union citation overseas. I came back, we went on eight hour patrols. I only crashed two Humvees, you know, but it, <laughs> over on top of me being overseas for seven months in Iraq, being overseas in Afghanistan for eight months, there was more good days than there were bad days. Well, me growing up, I was always the guy that was gonna be loud and motivation and gonna inspire people. That's what that's who I was because I never drank alcohol ever in my life. I never smoked a never. cigarette. Never. Never smoked a cigarette, did any drugs ever, haven't popped the pills, and haven't said a cuss word in 23 years. But he you, went, he went to fit in the Marine Corps, by the way. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but you... <laughs> but, but wait a minute. So you never did a single drug? Never. You never drank any alcohol? Never. But you dealt drugs? But I did sell drugs, yes. Help me understand that. That's what always confuses people. Because I had a different mindset. Because I saw what it was doing to people in my neighborhood. I saw when they were drinking, how they were acting. I saw when they were smoking, how they were acting, when they were popping pills. I saw what it was doing. But I also saw when they were gangbanging and they can get shot and they can get killed too. But I, I chose to do that. I had a different mindset. Because at 12, I had to figure out life different Why? than everybody else. Because I was in special ed classes from second grade through the 12th grade. So I thought I was dumb. I didn't think I was smart. Teachers said that I would never mount anything. They said I'd be dead or in prison. So I'm going to challenge you. Help me understand how you did not want to be different as it related to the street. Because your friends mm -hmm. were selling drugs. Your friends were gang banging. How come you didn't want to be different in that regard? Cause it's a great question. So I'm so glad you asked that question. The reason why I chose that field it because I didn't personally see any harm with being a cheater and a player. So I was a cheater and a player breaking women's heart as well. That was the thing, the, one of the things that I really didn't like about myself. And I saw that, but I didn't see it doing any harm. But you were in the NFL at this time too, correct? Or well, you, you were still playing football? Yeah, I was still definitely playing football. And it, so at this time, I had just signed a contract to go play in Arena 2 at this time. And I just signed a contract in 2007, I'll never forget it. We were leaving the concert, we were going back home, it was like four in the morning. I was tired, I just met a girl earlier that night, she was coming to get me. And so we were in the car, I was in the passenger side, and the car pulled, we pulled, we turned left into the close lane, the car behind us turned into the far lane. And as they were driving next to us, I can hear the commotion, I can hear them saying, one dude in the back was like, hey, slow down, slow down. And before I can get out, that he was about to let us have it to my boy that was driving, they were already letting us have it. And for me, I knew if I let, if I got my waist and up safe, that I was gonna live. So I turned and got on the back seat of the floor. And so my cheek got hit and my leg got hit. So 11 bullets, when the detective came to the hospital, he said, are you Mr. Rich? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, you're lucky to be alive. I said, no, you're not. I said, no weapon formed against me, sir, prosper and God is my father. 
and my mom was sitting right there. And he said, well, 11 bullets hit your door. My mom just got done praying at 4 o'clock in the morning. What is she doing up at 4 in the morning? She felt something and she heard something. She said she got on her knees. She started praying. You and your mom were pretty close. Absolutely, we are. Even though there was a lot of turmoil in, in your house. Yes. And so how, how did that set you up for who you've become? Meaning there are a lot of people that, that and I'm, you've been very honest with it, so I'm just going to throw it out. Your mother was a prostitute. Well, yeah, I don't. I mean, you can. I guess you can say that in that in that in that line. I guess you can. I mean that that was that was the right. as I recall, you you used that word with me at one point. Mm -hmm. um, you saw men coming and going in the house, in yes. the very least. Mm -hmm. um, your father was not there. Not there. He was in jail. I don't know Is where that he correct? was. Correct. I don't know where he was at. Okay. Um, and that's where I kind of go back to your positive nature is something to be admired, respected, and, and, you know, everybody should strive for it, but you have all the reason in the world to, to do what, you know, Denver did. And, and that was, you know what, I've had enough. I'm, I'm going to take my own life. Did that ever cross your mind? No. And so for, for me, it was like, I, I believe that the suicidal ideation, like the gangs in the street life. That was mine because I wasn't strong enough to say, I'm going to take my life. There's no way in the world. I wasn't that strong. So, Denver, you had, you did do drugs. Yes. Every single day on a daily basis. Every single day. Every single day. day. Every single day. Literally. I even had a girlfriend that we got to a point that I was signing a piece of paper telling how much money I was borrowing from her. I think it was her birthday or something like that. And I remember going back to the club because I left my card or my ID there. They were like, man, you got to slow down on the cocaine, bro. And I got pictures of my jaw just literally tweaked out to the right, just over and over and over. And it just became a habit. If Denver doesn't have cocaine, there's something wrong at that point. Were you trying to forget something? Were you trying to numb yourself from reality? What what was it that led to this? I didn't want to be around veterans. I was angry with the vet or military. Um, I burned my uniform, to be honest with you, during that time. And it got to a point that even one night I grabbed my laptop with all the videos and all the pictures and smashed it all over the floor. Like, smashed it completely. Hammer to it, everything. Lost everything from Iraq, Afghanistan, you know? So had a bonfire in the backyard, put all my uniforms in it. And that was the moment that it was just like, wow, what am I doing? In the movie, me pushing away people was from after I started getting healthy because I was pushing people away because I was ready for a new beginning. That's that part right there. So what were you trying to forget from overseas? You know, I think it was just more of forgetting that I was so young and I didn't want to remember that piece of me is I was just angry with how the military just was like, okay, bye. Okay, bye. Okay, you want to get out? Okay, bye. Not realizing that I was going to miss it one day, that I was going to miss all those uniforms, missing that piece of me. That's a piece of me. I'm a piece of history at this point right now. Literally Iraq and Afghanistan, being with 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, it's history. Have you been able to reconcile all that? Oh, yeah, 100%. Okay. 100, 100%. And that's why now I'm getting my uniforms back. Now I want to make the shadow box. Now I want to find everything. I won't find a lot of what I had that was personal, you know, having like my boots, for instance. But I've found some of my dog tags, for instance, buried in all my stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, now it's, I want to get everything back. I got a shadow box with all my challenge coins in it. I got my medals that I do still have from Iraq, Afghanistan. There's a handful that are missing, of course, but I got them put up and I want to get my dress blues back. I want to build out a little shadow box. I want to do this stuff because I know when I, if I have grandkids, if whatever it might be, I want to be able to tell the stories of what I've achieved and not, it's not any more of what I suffered, it's what I achieved overseas. Because there is a lot that we've done really good overseas. Second Battalion, 7th Marines, 
also referred to as the Forgotten Battalion, correct? Yep, absolutely. Y'all have had, I think, about 55 suicides? 56 since 2009. Why? I think that was, that's what I kind of just said. It was we just felt like we didn't matter when we got back from Afghanistan. So when we went over to Afghanistan, it was go. When we came back, they fapped out. They basically released 90% of us and didn't even give us a chance. They asked us to re-enlist, <laughs> never forget it, in Afghanistan three days after we got back from our deployment. You lost... 20 or so 21. in Afghanistan, Yeah, 21 in Afghanistan. Yeah. Josh, when, when you hear Denver talking about this stuff, the, the sacrifice, the, the pain, the, um, the suicides, what does this trigger for you from the standpoint of, of the athletic field? Well, like for me, because I lost, you know, five of my good friends to suicide and they were all athletic and those that they were all older than me. And when you and they all play sports really well. Now we have people now more athletes are being depressed more. They're committing suicide and it's becoming more and more and more of a thing. And that's why MVP, I think, is phenomenal because it gets to merge the two together and we get to hear their stories about what they've gone through over there and then they come back over here and they're still dealing with the same exact thing. It's just like us. Why do you think the numbers of depression and suicide have continued to go up? We've put more and more attention on this as a society and it doesn't seem like it's making a dent. In fact, it seems like the problem just continues to be exacerbated. You guys are around individuals every Tuesday night in the, in the peer to peer. Why is this happening? What, what do we need Connection. to do differently? Connection. Get out. Get out of the house. I'll say it just like that, Blunt. When I was isolated, when I wasn't around the peers that I needed, I was the most depressed in my life. And I think this is where I feel is that we're not held accountable a lot of times. We're not held accountable to get out of the house, to get up. I say this all the time is as long as you're connected and get out and get connected to anything, I don't care what it is. Even if it's a bad badminton game, I don't care. Mm -hmm. But being around somebody that's like minded and somebody that gets you and can understand you that you can tell your darkest, deepest secrets to. Does it have to be around someone who's like minded? No. I think just anybody that you trust. And I've said that a couple times here is having somebody that can trust but then give you the real honest feedback. And I'll tell you right now at MVP, we will tell you what you don't want to hear. We will tell you the honest to God feedback that you need to hear, that you may not want to hear, but a lot of times you need to hear something and somebody to challenge you to be better than what you were the day before. Mm -hmm. All right, I want, I want to ask you both one other thing. What have you learned about humanity through this journey? Humanity to me means more than anything else in this world because what I've seen my mom go through and the challenges she faced and what she did to sacrifice herself, body, for me and my sister, second to none. And that's why I'm so positive and uplifting and encouraging and inspiring to other people because I never want to see a person, a woman, have to go through challenges like my mom did. I am going to put you on the spot. The next time your mother comes to town, mm -hmm. I want to meet her. Absolutely, you will. You, you talk about her so openly, so candidly, but yet so lovingly. Absolutely. And I mean, a person like that, I want to meet him. Honestly, you ask humanity, and for me, it's there's a lot of good that comes out of what we do. And there's a lot of good when I see other organizations and what they're doing. We have to all work together at the end of the day, and that's how we all have the end goal. We're all trying to help each other out, and sometimes we just don't know that we're helping each other out. Yeah. As we wrap up, um, as you know, Carry the Load is about making sure that we, we keep the memory alive of those who did not uh, make it through and they can't sit here with us, those who made the ultimate sacrifice. Um, Denver, I know you especially have a few of those people. Yep. Who are we carrying today? Ivan Wilson today. Ivan Wilson. I've, Ivan Wilson. April 21st, 2008, <coughs> definitely. Um, yep. 
Anybody for you? For me? <coughs> <coughs> I don't know what just happened. <laughs> for me, it's always going to be my grandma. Grandma, <coughs> grandma Dot. February 24th. <coughs> Woo! 2011. She was taken from me. Hospital killed her. So, she's... She saved me when I was a baby. And so she's always going to be the rock. Her and my mother are my rocks. Grandma and Ivan Wilson. Absolutely. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. I, thank I you. really, yeah. thank you. really appreciate what you guys do. Uh, Y'all have something special. And I really hope that more and more people find out about it. And y'all have been a great partner to carry the load. And, and we... Uh, we're not done yet. No, we've come a long <laughs> way in a very short period of time. Okay, can I tell you something about Carry the Load? Sure. Well, Carry the Load for me, in Memorial Day, I had I had said it at our session afterwards. Mm -hmm. As an athlete, talking for an athlete. But Memorial Day for me was being in the hood, barbecuing, go put some flowers on grandma, all my grandma's graves, my auntie, my family's grave. That's what we did. But when I went to Carry the Load this year for the first time ever, experiencing seeing all the soldiers that we lost first responders seeing their faces and walking those miles and seeing people in the, the tricycles next to me riding one leg take the leg off get in the wheelchair and continuing seven miles right next to me as i'm watching and reading these pictures of these stories of these men and women that we've lost did something different to me. Carry the load, Memorial Day. I've told, I reached out to my people back home in Oklahoma. I said, I need y'all to come with me next year. Just come with me. I need you to experience something that I experienced. I've been to 52 funerals, Todd. Like, it's, but that one right there did something to me. It showed me about a different kind of care and a different kind of love and a different kind of passion. So I'm all for it. I, I love the way you said that. It shows a different kind of love. And um, as we, as three of us know, we need more of that. Absolutely. Yes. Definitely. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you guys for being here. Thank Truly you. appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Appreciate you. Appreciate it. If this resonated with you in the least, please subscribe and like, and please, please, please share it with at least one person. These are the stories that make us uniquely American. These are the stories that preserve the integrity of our nation.